Can, can you hear me, Nicole? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Okay, and uh, can you see me? Yes. Oh, great. And I'll do your okay. intro and then you will have the floor, sir. Okay, thank you. All right. Dr. Madhu Thangvalu conducts the Graduate Space Exploration Architectures Concept Synthesis Studio in the Department of Astronautical Engineering within the Viterbi School of Engineering at the University of Southern California. He also teaches the Extreme Environment Habitation Design Seminar in the School of Architecture, where he is a graduate thesis advisor. And today you will be speaking on humans on Mars, past, present, and future. You have the floor, sir. Welcome, and thank you for being here. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Nicole. And um, uh, thank you, all of the students. Uh, I, would, I would really like to know uh, who is on, uh, uh, who is watching and from where, Nicole? Okay, we have several students from all around the world. Students, if you want to type in where you're from in the chat, I will read them off. Oh, we don't have to be that elaborate. But, uh, okay, well, there's several from Dubai, United Arab Emirates, um, Egypt, a bunch in the U.S., um, Poland, so all around the world, New Excellent. Zealand, Tim's from New Zealand. And so, and the replay will go out to all the students. So all of the students are not on here live, okay. but they will be watching it because it's nighttime where some of the students are. I can imagine that now. Um, so we, we have, have China a... also, China, oh, California. Wonderful. <laughs> wonderful, China, California. That's good to say that because California is a different planet. But I'm here in California and uh, uh, welcome you all. Um, I was with uh, Bob uh, Zubrin uh, not too long ago, I think two or three weeks ago, he was at the um, International Space Development Meeting and he had a fiery lecture. You know, it's a pleasure to listen to Bob say it like it is. And um, I'm just coming off a meeting uh, in which we were discussing uh, um, the planetary habitations and so on. Um, so welcome you all. Uh, how much time do we have, Michelle? About uh, uh, 30 minutes? You have 30 minutes to talk okay. and then 15 minutes for questions. Okay, good. Uh, so um, as you know, um, yesterday was 4th of July and we spent the time uh, looking up at the skies uh, here in uh, Palos Verdes, which is a beach city in Southern California. And I was, I was very interested, became very interested in what's happening because we don't use fireworks anymore. We use drones. So uh, it takes uh, the edge of the fire department because you know we are coming to summer season in the, and uh, we don't want fires. So we had a fantastic drone show. But anyway, we will get to that later. In that, uh, <clears throat> how many of you know that the University of Southern California has an astronautical engineering program, not an aerospace engineering program, but an astronautical engineering program in which uh, I, 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 it, that's my home department. We talk about things once you, uh, once you scale the atmosphere and go beyond and things get really weird once you are beyond the atmosphere. So our course is very selective and um, it's, to try, you know, we can do distance education all over the world now, as all of you are tuning in, you can dial in and get admitted to the USC Astronautical Engineering Program. Within that program, I teach what is called the ASTE 527 Studio. And you can Google that too, because our products are on the web. So it's a three unit class. And the focus is on unfettered, unbridled imagination, which means uh, I am interested in knowing what the human mind, your mind can do as opposed to what other people say and other people do. And what we do, 
is create concepts, a variety of concepts, no holds barred, say it like it is, <clears throat> and let other people decide what your idea is about. <clears throat> I, I look for originality, which means um, you want to be thinking for yourself. It's hard to think for yourself because sometimes people will come up to me and say, all these ideas have been thought about. What can I say that's different? You know what? The human mind is versatile and we can always, always, always depend on new ideas. And the reason I'm talking to high school students today is because you are the future. You guys, those beautiful girls and <coughs> young men among you, you are the future. You have to help us, the country that we are in. So we do things that are independent of uh, agency and industry views. Now, we have good friends uh, in our uh, um, uh, studio. Uh, Buzz Aldrin uh, lives close by. Uh, he comes to our studio and likes to inspire us all. This happens in the fall and our, our uh, uh, instructors, reviewers, include people from all different disciplines. From the left to the right, you'll see my own professors from uh, years ago, doctors, engineers, uh, founders of uh, institutions, cinematographers, lawyers, policymakers, uh, people from all over the world. You will see people from Japan, Germany, China, India, Iran, Iraq, everybody is in our studio. And this is the only class, one of the only classes at USC where the reviewers and guests outnumber the students 10 to one. So we have 10 students, we'll have a hundred people at our finals. <clears throat> so um, um, the, difference between, the difference between engineering students uh, in the fall and architecture students in uh, my architecture students uh, in the spring, two schools in which I teach, uh, is that architects have a grounding in real world activities. They depend, their bread and butter depends on ideas that you can directly engage with people. And here you see my architecture students uh, in, in the spring, which is coming after the fall session. And you'll see that I, uh, I engage students from all over the world again. Uh, these are the beauties of a, of, a, of a world university. Students come from all over with very different ideas. And they're very promising ideas. You'll see people from France, um, you'll see people from uh, Germany, Japan, like uh, you do in the uh, engineering school. And they all have wonderful ideas to give us. And here you see um, the students from my architecture school. And what differentiates them is that they are asking, what can space activities do for humanity on Earth right now, not tomorrow, not the future? So between the architects and the engineers, we have some very fruitful discussions. Now, <clears throat> um, we talk about, um, in, in the School of Engineering, we talk about space, uh, spacecraft and the needs in space. But um, in the space architecture class, we talk about space habitats, how alien environments uh, affect it and how we can improve the quality of life, the habitability of structures we design. And um, as you all know, I showed you in the slides before, the people who practice this are not just astronauts or engineers or specialized uh, folks, but they come from all disciplines doctors, lawyers, artists are very important when we design for the future of humanity. I want you all to take a look at our website when you get a chance. 
My slides are running fast. I don't know why. Let me see this. <clears throat> so um, um, uh, we have a, a book um, that you can get on Amazon. It is the textbook prescribed for the class. And um, uh, we are writing the third edition now. We are looking at the first edition, second edition, and now we are working on the third edition. It's, we are planning to have it out next summer. And it, of course, all of you are thinking about Mars, but we think the stepping stone to Mars is the moon. And uh, so uh, we are hoping to engage you all uh, by next summer with the latest edition, uh, which is uh, which got a lot more materials. <clears throat> Oops, let's go here. So getting to the point of, uh, about Mars. Um, I'm going to classify them into the past literature, the present of Mars, and what we can expect in the future. So some observations here, I'll go through them rapidly because of time. Um, we have known that uh, people have been talking about, about Mars for a long time, and uh, it started maybe even earlier than Jonathan Swift, who wrote, all of you uh, have read Gulliver's Travels, you probably know him. And then to astronomer Ashraf Hall, who also uh, started viewing through a telescope and uh, started to observe things. And you seem probably know uh, that um, he had a, he discovered certain um, parts of, um, of the, um, of the uh, satellites that uh, Jonathan Swift talked about, but did not know. And these are coincidences in history and, uh, and uh, literature that are quite fascinating to read of them. <clears throat> so uh, further on, folks started to draw up uh, images uh, of what, um, uh, what uh, uh, Mars might look like, Percival Lovell, was one of an astronaut, one of our astronomers who lived up not too far from here. And he started to draw up um, beautiful things. And he started to um, propagate the idea that um, uh, there may be a life and people on Mars. Um, then it went on in the um, in 1912s. And uh, around that time, people really got engaged in thinking about, about Mars as a livable and um, place, perhaps with societies like uh, on Earth. These were stories. Um, then uh, uh, Ray Bradbury, who was a well-known author, I'm sure some of you know his works. So he used to live close by here. We used to go meet with him. And uh, Ray was very special because all of you know his uh, Fahrenheit 451 work. And uh, he wrote a lot about Mars and the Martian Chronicles. And then we race up towards um, uh, reality. I think we have to show that here, present. Somehow my slides are clicking fast. Anyhow, so in, in the present is when we start to deal with grapple with real science, real technologies, real physics, and uh, real politics. So what happens is that um, um, in the 50s, uh, soon after the war, the Second World War, in, in the mid 45s, a large number of, uh, of German scientists um, uh, were literally <laughs> imported into the United States and Russia from Germany uh, after the war. And I think now you are looking at the pictures here. Um, that operation was called Operation Paperclip. You can take a look at that. You'll see every one of them lined up here, including Werner von Braun. We, can you see the pointer, Nicole? Yes, I, we can I, see I, it. Great. Yes. There we go. So you see Werner von Braun there. So all of them came over to the US. <clears throat> And um, all of that excited um, uh, public relations. The awe and excitement of going out 
into space and doing things became the thing to do in the early 1950s. And of all people, um, uh, Disney, Walt Disney was involved in it. And so were people like Billy Lay and others. They imagine the most beautiful imagery coming uh, from uh, the uh, cinematographic views of, uh, of imagineers, people dreaming really wild dreams, what we could do in outer space. And these are some of the pictures from Chesley Bonnester. There's a beautiful documentary out there from uh, a producer who lives very close to us here. And I wish you will take a look at it. At, I think it's called uh, um, a Brush with the Future. Take a look at it to see what, what Chesley Bonnester, who was an architect who, who designed many of these things. Now we are coming to a time <clears throat> when reality it takes precedence over just dreams and imagination. And you'll see rockets being built. It's fascinating, but in the 1950s and 60s, we thought that the way to go places farther out into space is using nuclear rocket ships. And you're looking at some of the nuclear rocket engines that were produced in the 50s and tested right into the 60s. And we were at the verge of going to Mars. And these are some of the uh, nuclear reactors with their rocket engines that were, uh, that were uh, produced and tested under the NERVA and the ROVA program. You must study that. And then the 60s appeared. This is the testing of uh, some of the uh, NERVA <laughs> rocket engines. Sometimes things did not go well, but that's true even today when you test rocket engines. And then uh, before you know it, we arrived at the 1960s. In the 1960s, in late 1960s, a movie came out called 2001, A Space Odyssey. And in it was depicted in very clear and sharp terms what spacecraft, space habitats, astronauts, and the devices like um, EVA suits and uh, um, orbital maneuvering vehicles and large spacecraft were all shown beautifully. I happen to know Arthur Clark, and Clark mentioned to me that I should talk with a person by the name of Pierce Bisoni. And he suggested a book. If you have a chance, please get his book, Pierce Bisoni, a filming. 2001. It's an incredible review on how architects, engineers get together to design a beautiful, beautiful spacecraft. This is the design that he had of the Discovery vehicle. Uh, it's a nuclear powered rocket ship. And uh, on that year, just after the movie was born, you won't believe it, Apollo came. Uh, came as a reality, uh, hitting us right in the face by saying, uh, 2001 is not fiction, it is real. And here you see uh, the first images taken during uh, uh, the first few Apollo missions. This is Apollo 8. And soon after, proceeding soon after the next year, the next year after, we were on the moon. And uh, uh, and then uh, one thing led to another. There were a lot of discussions. And uh, when people landed on the moon for the first time, uh, everybody uh, wondered what that meant for humanity. People living on another planet, on another satellite, looking at Earth from far away, wearing a suit because uh, there was nothing there absolutely barren and pure vacuum. And what Norman Cousins, uh, he was a, a, a author and a sort of a philosopher, he said that what was significant about the lunar voyage was not that men set foot on the moon, but that they set eye on the earth. And this is important for us to know. Going out is also about looking in. There you see Buzz Aldrin, 
uh, or it's in a spacesuit. And um, so um, there was a, 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 a very interesting person, again, who lived in Southern California, close by, uh, who coined the term spaceship Earth. The idea that planet Earth is moving in empty space and therefore we are part of a spaceship. And uh, this attracts a lot of architects even today. The idea that we have finite resources and we live on spaceship Earth. And uh, I think it was Cousins or no, it was McLuhan who said, we are not passengers, but we are crew on spaceship Earth, which means we have to take care of our finite resources. So um, men landed, the uh, humans landed on the moon. And then soon after, we started talking about, hey, is it possible that there is life on Mars? And to add to the controversy, during the Clinton administration, Dave McKay and others used electron microscopes on, uh, on meteorites uh, to, to figure out that yes, indeed, there are objects that look like microorganisms in meteorites that come to us from, um, from Mars. And um, so um, that is where we are at pretty much, you know, in terms of knowing what, um, what is happening, but I'll get to some more slides on it. But there is this philosophy of space that all of you need to think about. Don't think we are pushing anything on you, but you want to give it some thought. It's a yin and yang kind of philosophy, which says, there are several people alive now with us, including Elon and Bezos and Hanlon and uh, Frank. They all say that there are many, many reasons to go out into space and occupy planets and live there. It makes our species more, um, more nice and more rounded than just being in the cocoon of planet Earth where we are already practicing what is called a zero sum game. It's not a good thing. If you go out into space, we become a far fuller species uh, looking after um, us and looking after the biosphere in many, many ways than we do now. So several people talk about different reasons why we go. All of them harp back to the fact that we need to take care of Mother Earth. And this is something that resonates even in my talk uh, just a few minutes ago uh, with the other group. So <clears throat> what's about the future? So that's, that's what, um, you know, we look at what's happening in the past and the thinking and so on. So the future is all of you. All of you are the future. And the things you show and so on are just artifacts, products of things that you folks will be doing. And uh, we will be retired and watching you do this. It's starting to happen now. And uh, this is, uh, these are the rovers that are landed on Mars doing exemplary science. And uh, JPL is not very far from here. I go there often and uh, you'll see the vehicles are being, um, are being commanded um, on a daily basis, going from rock to rock, from valley to, valley to um, hills. And then now we have even developed a, a, a helicopter that is able to change the entire method of how we go about um, discovering a new things on Mars in a very quick way. And you probably have heard about some of the experiments that are ongoing on perseverance. It's called um, a MOXIE, that is generating oxygen from carbon dioxide. It's a fantastic idea. But over time, we think we will have to generate it in very large quantities as opposed to a small experimental package, we will go, get to see manufacturing of, of things we need, oxygen, fuel, and so on. So what is Mars? <laughs> Mars is a barren place. It's hostile, not only in terms of the atmosphere, which is almost pure carbon dioxide, 
at a very, very low pressure. Uh, for those who know uh, climbing up mountains, this is much, much worse. You know, it, uh, some parts of Mars, some parts of the mountains of Mars are sticking out into space to give you a rough idea how thin the atmosphere of Mars is. It's got these uh, wonderful satellites around it. We don't know if they belong to Mars or were captured. We are still thinking about them. And um, uh, Phobos and Deimos are, are these objects that race through the skies through the day and night. It's an eccentric. You know, what is um, different about Mars than planet Earth, for instance, is the orbit is eccentric, which means it's not fully circular. It is um, elliptical, a little bit more elliptical than it is for the rest of the planet. And that causes tremendous problems because it creates uh, extremes in climate and weather. And you can have a lot of dust dumps almost all the time. Sometimes it covers the whole globe of Mars which means sunlight coming down to Mars, which is already very low, becomes even less and pretty much dark during um, a storm that can last months to years. So <clears throat> here we can see the effects of dust storms. And um, so what are some of the challenges? Low gravity, lack of an, a magnetosphere, and there are some ideas being thought about how to create a magnetosphere on Mars. Radiation is a problem. Solar radiation, solar particulate radiation on the surface is a problem. Pure carbon dioxide and very low pressure. And now we know that the surface has percolates in it and it's very toxic. It's poisonous for humans to walk around and mess around with. We know that climate is a problem and very dim sunlight when you have it. So uh, what about um, uh, doing some help with uh, getting um, a handle on gravity? Uh, I just mentioned this to the other class that um, uh, we don't have a handle on how to create gravity except by spinning and causing a an acceleration and a force um, that generates something akin to gravity, but it has no resemblance whatsoever because you're dealing with a lot of forces. And if some things go wrong, you go apart. In gravity, when things go wrong, you come together. But in centripetal force, centripetal acceleration and centrifugal forces, if things happen, you fly apart. Think about this when you design your spacecraft and you want to do gravity. Here is studied some of the studies we've studied and um, we are looking at how to protect ourselves from deep space radiation, um, which is an ongoing effort. And we know that radiation kills, so we need to think about that. And ideas are prevailing about how to make, make a magnetosphere for Mars by using a magnetic field further out that can uh, cut out um, solar particulate radiation. So welcome to Mars. Um, <laughs> we'll be depending on you all to see how to get there and do the good things we wanna do. Um, we know that we can produce food um, from the atmosphere now. There are some people who are working on it. And um, we also know we can go faster and faster and faster. It's one way that can have ramifications for building spacecraft that can take you quickly to places. And uh, all of you will be designing that. <clears throat> so one week, I propose one week Mars tours where you can go quickly and come back. I'm not a proponent of living as Elon Musk and others uh, uh, mentioned. Um, this radiation, we know how to, we are doing already some things on space station. And the new rockets are being built, um, uh, are about to be built, which will be much, much larger than anything that we've ever seen. Here you see the uh, 
the what's called the bimodal nuclear thermal rocket ships, which use both propulsion and power. We, we know how to make food. And these are some of our ideas that we have been studying about how to row on Mars. And I, fa I favor the one week Mars holiday tours. We go see the Olympus Mons and we get to go around the canyon systems, look at, um, at uh, and enjoy some uh, rides. And uh, I doubt that we will have a city like this, so it looks pretty. And uh, I think most of us will be living underground because that is the easy way to, or to take care of radiative problems. And um, all of you may know Carter Amar. If you're not, Google him. He is now a director at one of the national museums. He's a fantastic artist. He draws future of, uh, of Mars, uh, of activities on Mars and beautiful um, settlements, you know, early settlements. And these are Carter and Mars drawings. I love people who draw. And I always suggest to my students, please draw because humans we're drawing before we were doing numbers or writing. All of us have that in our, in our bodies to be able to draw. I go out, visit people, and I do some funny things from time to time, um, uh, testing spacesuits and so on. And um, as um, A.G. Wells says, the choice is ours. Is the future or nothing? Um, and uh, I want you all to look up some of the beautiful writings of people like uh, Buckminster Fuller. Take a look at what the United Nations is thinking, because that's a debate that's going on right now. And uh, here are some beautiful references for you. And I want to end. How much time we got, Michelle? Nic Nicole? We have about 11 minutes. Oh, perfect. Okay, so I'll stop in two minutes and then we'll take some questions. Um, you know, I enjoy uh, in new age music and this image came out uh, from the Warcliffe, um, which is a, a French uh, group uh, uh, doing uh, electronic trance. And uh, I thought this was a fantastic image to say, what do you want other planets to become if there are no, uh, no creatures living there? We want to beautify it, we want to enjoy it, and we want to be prolific as a species all over the universe. See, and the universe is very, 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 very big. How many varies? Maybe 17 varies before it becomes big. You look, each of these, each of these little darts is a stellar system. And think about the things uh, we could do perhaps meet with or have exchanges and flourish. You know, these are the things that space activity does for us. <clears throat> and this is the United Nations uh, Sustainable Goals. All of you need to be aware of planetary boundaries. How much Mother Earth can do for us before things start to start become difficult. That's why one of the reasons we want to go out. And innovation is the key. Creativity, innovation. And it is something that we do better than other of nature's magnificent creators, creatures. And that, so innovate. I'm talking to you today with the idea that each of you will innovate, create. Don't listen to the old people. <laughs> listen to your hearts and your minds. And um, Buzz Aldrin is a favorite um, who comes to our class. He wrote the foreword for our book. You want to read that uh, just for the foreword. <laughs> and uh, our third edition, we'll, we'll again uh, be looking out for some wonderful people to review. And here is our studio uh, site. Go there and pull up our ideas of the past few years. Um, and um, you'll see how uh, students and participants, many of them are from the industry and from the Department of Defense and so on, uh, create new ideas because creativity is the thing that the engine of progress is creativity. 
Climate change is a big action item. You have to wonder, and all of you, in the evenings, when you're having your tea or your dinner, think about why are you listening to me? Or why are you doing this, thinking about space? Because when you do that why exercise, you know exactly what and how. Take a look at our agenda here, and that should do it. Thank you, and I'm ready for a few questions, Nicole, if your students have any. Okay, um, we do have some questions coming in. I do okay. want to remind students of something um, you said earlier that Robert Zubrin said at the very beginning of the project. Um, there are differences in opinion from one speaker to the next. And you stated that you believe that we should just go on one week tours, whereas Elon Musk says permanent settlement. And I just wanted to ask you to talk about why you have that opinion and remind the students that all of these speakers are going to have different opinions. And it's up to you to figure out which way you want to go with your project. There's not you. one answer. There's <laughs> not one answer. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nicole, for putting me on the hot seat. Um, <laughs> it's, only, it's only because I'm a hardcore uh, engineer and know the li limitations of, uh, of the physics we practice today. And I'm, I'm not, uh, but, uh, but I'm positive that among your, your line of speak, um, the students are people who want to live on other planets. In fact, I just had a meeting uh, earlier today, and I mentioned Mars is not my favorite place to live. I want to live on uh, Enceladus, Europa, or Titan, uh, which is further out. Uh, but uh, and there are very beautiful skies in Titan. You know the the oceans are beautiful violet, and the skies are pink, and the clouds are orange. I mean, uh, even on Mars, um, clouds can be very pretty. But uh, if you gave me a rocket ship that could fly like that, I would go uh, to the satellites of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, where I think uh, it's extremely uh, beautiful scenery. But then at the end of the day, I'd like to come back, Nicole, and tell stories. Tell stories about the return of the astronaut, return of the hero, uh, to, to engage people uh, in opening up their minds uh, to what things we can do. So that is the quick answer. But I want all of you to go to Mars too, of course. <laughs> on the way. <laughs> okay, so from Andre, what are your thoughts on fusion propulsion? It will happen. It will happen, and um, you know, I um, I just penned the note to our buddies. Hey, please tell us how we can break free of the thermodynamic cycle that physics teaches us now, because whenever we generate heat, whenever we generate heat, and heat is needed to do work, um, a lot of it is wasted. A lot of heat is wasted in the systems we design for spacecraft. So we are in a quandary about if you can generate so much um, energy, how are you going to dissipate all that heat? And before you know it, your spacecraft looked like a spider with radiators flying out and <laughs> left and right. And uh, I laugh at stuff um, when uh, somebody proposes very high energy density um, uh, reactors. And uh, fission, fusion, uh, when we do this, and we will do it, we will do it, becomes a cleaner option in terms of radiation and waste heat. And um, I wish them all well. In fact, right here in Southern California are people working on potential uh, fusion reactors. And uh, we do get some feedback on them. Good question. Go for it. Yeah. Bring, us, bring us your fusion reactor. The students should look up the National Ignition Facility. I think they're working That's on right. that there. That's right. And David has a couple of questions. He would like to know, when do you think people will be able to live full-time on Mars? I think, I, think, <clears throat> I think that is a question um, you know, that will take some time because terraforming is the term that is used to make a place 
habitat or surrounding um, uh, livable. And there's, there are stages we think will happen. Um, we think that first we will take over small regions of Mars, small areas, perhaps craters, uh, underground lava tubes, uh, or um, uh, certain natural features and cover them so that we can have what you call para terraforming, that is regional terraforming. And we do this here on earth too. When we go on forward base camps, we enclose a little area to keep the environment or the uh, uh, natural um, predators out and we contain it. And then you slowly extend out. These are areas in which architects have tremendous strength because we know how city planning, you know, villages expand through ribbon development and so on. So there's a lot of literature. And um, I think it will happen over time. Um, <laughs> don't press me on a date uh, because many of these things we do. I think you, uh, I think I don't want to um, dampen your hopes, but many of things that we do uh, beyond um, you know, earth uh, has to do with policies and uh, the will of a people or society to move and do things. And this is why uh, it's taken 50 years since we landed on the moon to go back, just go back and put people on the moon. But you know what? We're going to be doing it. Lots more comments and questions coming in. Ahmed. Oh. Uh, Ahmed would like to tell you that your passion for space and the way you talk, express, and present are very beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, dear Ahmed. Where where is he? Where is he from, Nicole? Uh, he Dubai, I think. Oh, I can't great. remember everyone. Where I apologize. Syria. Excuse me. Syria. Oh, Syria. I'm sorry, okay. Ahmed. Okay. Yeah, I have um, friends in Syria. Yeah. Okay, um, David would like to know, what do you think is the hardest thing us humans can achieve in space? Oh, one more time, what is the hardest thing? As we can achieve in space, what's, what's gonna be the biggest challenge? Oh, that's a good question. Is that David? Uh, who yes. asked? Yes. Okay, uh, and where is David from? Can you tell, Nico? What's I'm David? from Romania. 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 David, in my little life, what I find the hardest is um, to understand other people, um, fully understand, appreciate their predicaments, and feel uh, empathy uh, for my fellow beings. And uh, this, is this is true. Um, uh, in space activities. When we go out uh, into space, you're going to be a collective organism, which means you will really depend for your life on your neighbor. And unlike on Earth, where you can open the door, go for a walk in the park, and get your mind back together and come back home, you can't do that in the tight constraints of uh, what you call a spacecraft or even a community uh, uh, living uh, in, uh, in close quarters. So it's been the hardest part. And, uh, and NASA spends a lot of effort teaming, teaming people together. And as you know, uh, we are able to team uh, robots with people much better than people with people. And it is the hardest thing to get people together um, even in the common pursuit of exploration. And you will see this, um, you will see uh, aberrations happening in forward bases on earth where highly accomplished scientists and professionals have difficulties understanding and engaging each other uh, in, a, in a synergetic way. So that is the number one issue, humans human relations. And that is why we engage a lot of psychologists and anthropologists and the humanities folks uh, in uh, this uh, very, very critical, uh, critical um, progressive, um, progressive endeavor, uh, human relations.
uh, in my opinion. Is that a good answer? That's a great answer. <laughs> I, I would say keeping peace. That would be my answer. <laughs> that's, that's even more, uh, more sharp. Yeah, keeping peace. Yes, David has another question. What would be the first thing that you would ask someone from 100 years in the future about space? Great question. Oh, that's, 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 a, that's an interesting one. You know, um, I would first say uh, communication. Uh, how do you communicate um, instantly? Uh, because as you know, uh, right now um, in our uh, in our pursuit of human space flight, um, when things happen, uh, it takes uh, minutes, sometimes half an hour uh, before you know that your vehicle has landed um, uh, safely. And uh, uh, I know that uh, somehow in the back of my mind, I know that instant communication is possible. And that is why we talk about quantum teleportation and uh, the things that happen in, in, the, in the universe today. You know, particles, <laughs> this is a little bit of the physics for you. Um, particles uh, seem to uh, be entangled um, instantaneously. Uh, it's a physical phenomenon that we are starting to use now. We call it quantum entanglement. And um, what it tells me is that we are on the verge. We are the threshold of new communication systems uh, that you can use to instantly communicate uh, at, at interplanetary and interstellar distances. If we master that, I think we can do wonders uh, flying all over the universe. Uh, you know, forget just the solar system. If we can communicate, uh, instantly, uh, it will change our, not just the worldview, our view of the universe. Yeah, quantum computing, I think, will change everything about humanity in every way. It is already doing that, and um, we have some difficulties with the, uh, with the signal to noise ratios, but all that is um, uh, in the noise, and we are, we are, we are getting better. Yes, good, good uh, question. very good question. Cal L would like to know what is saying, you spoke about how many different people have different opinions about why we should go to Mars. Uh -huh. Do you have an opinion? If so, what is it? Also, your presentation was very inspiring and gave me a lot to think about. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, and uh, to your question, um, uh, again, can you can you just repeat the first few words? Uh, uh, I had some Cal, thoughts. Cal Cal L was saying you spoke about difference? how many different people have different opinions That's about right. why we should go to Mars. Yeah, yeah. You know, my my thinking has always been, uh, you know, this uh, very similar to our uh, late friend uh, um, uh, who was an astronomer and a very important physicist, Freeman Dyson. Now, <laughs> Freeman said something that's very obvious, and that is, if you take a telescope, and I hope some of you have telescopes, I have a couple in our home, and I love enjoying watching the skies in the night. If you look outward, uh, you will notice that's pretty cold, pretty dark, uh, pretty silent, and, um, uh, of course, you know it's it's not real because if you look closer to closer and closer, if you look at the sun, for instance, it's extremely dynamic, and so there are lots of things happening, and um, it's my thinking that I would like to partake more in the happenings of not just our solar system, but in the happenings of the cosmos, and. Um, um, that is the main reason or, or the drive um, that many of us have. When you look deeper into the why question uh, that I asked you, why do we do all these things? And I think it has to do with a resonance in our bodies, um, which is made from the stuff of stars, you know, type three stars. And um, so you're looking at it and going like, hmm, 
Uh, so that could be the reason why you want to be uh, associated uh, with the cosmos. And um, that is, the, that is the, the reason. And then uh, the, <laughs> the United Nations tells you, you know, um, when you're looking outwards, you're also uh, subconsciously looking inwards towards earth. Um, you know, if you've read the philosophies, I love philosophy. In the Indian philosophy, uh, they distill it down to uh, a phrase. It's, it's in the Sanskrit, they say, tatvam ase, which means you are that. You're observing the universe and the universe is speaking back to you. Carl Sagan says that we are embodiments of the universe knowing itself. <laughs> you know, it tickles your mind, but think about it. Um, at the deepest, deepest sense, um, when we engage in, co in the cosmos and cosmic events, and I have a lot of astronomer friends, I know many of them are very quiet people because they see what is going on in the cosmos. And 4th of July is nothing. <laughs> compared to what's happening out there, the dynamic cosmos. And yet, it looks still and quiet and very, very deep. And those things uh, resonate with the, with the cells in our body, I think. And that is, that is my thinking on it. Uh, sorry to be so, so uh, <laughs> philosophical. No, it's beautiful. And I think there's a place for philosophy and science and more people should understand it, um, in my yes. opinion. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, say, I say that, you know, because we make some beautiful toys. Mm -hmm. And then you ask that question, why do you do that? You know, it gives you a sense of peace. It gives you a center to work from. But in the end, it's really about that connection that you make with nature. Thank you for that <laughs> deep question. Um, and Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson, who redid Cosmos, said we're made of star stuff. And if you've had high school chemistry yet, students, you know all the atoms except for hydrogen came from exploded stars. That's so right. you are literally every atom in your body except some mm. hydrogen and maybe a little helium comes from stars that exploded. So we do have a resonance That's with right. space because we are literally made from remnants of exploded stars. And so right. you ever wanted to be a star? You're already a star. You're already you a star. <laughs> and, and I would say students, if you have not already done so, you can get it on Amazon for a few dollars. Watch the first season of Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos. If you, it is a beautiful program. It's a remake of Carl Sagan's from the seventies and eighties. And it will help you understand a lot about the universe and the it's project true. you're working on. This is true because, you know, I think um, uh, um, Carl um, and, uh, uh, Tyson uh, was a student mm -hmm. of, um, of um, Carl Sagan. Yes. And uh, I did not know at the last ISDC um, uh, in Austin, uh, in, in Texas, in um, Dallas, um, yeah, Pascal Lee was there. Is he going to talk to you guys? Um, not, not here, maybe at the conference in October. Okay, so Pascal you know, was um, uh, Carl Sagan's last um, TA, teaching assistant. I did not know that till uh, this time when I was, was talking to Pascal. You know, I, I sure hope um, you get him to talk to high school students at some point in time. Yeah, but okay. I think um, all of you or some of you will attend the um, October meeting at ASU. Yes, at they're all invited. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, wonderful. They're all invited. Wonderful. And I would, um, David has another question, and then we've okay. taken up so much of your time, Dr. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm always um, pleased to talk to uh, uh, younger students because they are our only, only hope, Nicole, yes. uh, to move ahead, yeah. Um, David would like to know, what would you ask someone from another galaxy? <laughs> uh, you're, you're talking about my, my favorite subject. You know, <clears throat> I like to think that, you know, if you look uh, just 
within our galaxy um, and you draw a bound around the habitable region uh, and uh, away from uh, the galactic uh, nucleus, galactic center, there must be thousands or millions of civilizations uh, who are actively participating in, you know what? Keeping us safe <laughs> from the dynamism and the violence that is happening at the nuclear center. A uh, few weeks ago, uh, a group from Northwestern University uh, using the Meerkat Observatory in South Africa, uh, they looked deep, probed deep through the dust into the heart uh, of, the, of, the, of the galaxy. And uh, Andrea Guess here at UCLA has been, uh, she got the Nobel Prize for looking at how stars are actively moving. I mean, I mean they're going around each other in a matter of a month, years. You know, the stars are moving because they're really being attracted by uh, the supermassive black hole uh, in the middle. And uh, the energies, the energies that are being uh, spent uh, is unimaginable. And uh, uh, just last year, um, there was a gamma ray burst that uh, somehow uh, hit our atmosphere and the highest uh, parts of our atmosphere and knocked out um, a whole layer, part of a layer uh, of our atmosphere. And this happening from um, millions of light years away. And so I'm going, there must be something happening, um, you know, forget the other galaxy, within our galaxy, that is keeping the light of consciousness alive. Um, because these things blow off all the time. And uh, I'm sure that uh, if I was talking to somebody uh, within our galaxy far away, I'd say, hey, what's happening? What's the situational awareness daily saying today? And I'm sure, I feel confident that the higher and more sensitive civilizations within our galaxy or without have mastered this. And that is the reason why um, conscious you know, life can exist in such a violent, uh, um, violent cosmos. And just think about it. The sun puts out coronal mass injections, CMEs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. once in a while. Once in a while, it just sweeps through Earth. I mean, random event, it sweeps through the Earth. And when that happens, like the Carrington event happened last century, I mean, century before, it creates havoc on Earth. And we are at a point in civilization where we depend on satellites around our Earth uh, for communications and doing a lot of things. A Carrington type event happening now in this century or other will wipe out all of those um, you know, high value assets. And so uh, you're really uh, playing Russian roulette and wondering why is it that, that we have not had that kind of a wipeout event for so many millions of years. You know, we talk about planetary defense and how asteroids and comets can change uh, Earth, uh, all of a sudden, you know, um, evolved dinosaurs become a chicken and uh, and then create life uh, that allows a new path that generates us. Um, it should be more than random probabilities. Uh, there must be some direction happening. Um, I'm not an ancient astronaut theorist, uh, but but I do think that there is something in nature that allows for the uh, evolution of species so that we understand the cosmos better and the cosmos talks back to us. And perhaps the reason, uh, reason for uh, being 
Um, I know that Elon Musk thinks all of what we see and all of what you do uh, is just a screen and the real thing is happening um, beyond us. Uh, if you read the stories of um, J.P. Lovecraft, uh, he'll say, eh, we don't matter. <laughs> the real things are happening elsewhere. You know, uh, you've, you've heard the saying, uh, do not meddle in, in the affairs of dragons. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we may be, for all you know, like ants are to us. Um, you know, we don't pay attention to them. Uh, <laughs> They don't um, worry about uh, cosmic, uh, um, uh, you know, supermassive black holes and so on. So there must be other levels of engagement. And uh, uh, so I would really like to ask them, hey, well, how's it going <laughs> in their language? <laughs> wow, wonderful answer. Okay, thank you so much, um, Professor Thangvalu, and I appreciate you being here again this year. Your recording will be uploaded to YouTube within the next 48 hours. Fantastic. <laughs> um, students are thanking you in the chat. Um, students, tomorrow at the morning session, we'll have Adrian Brown. He will be talking about uh, the Perseverance rover so far. Excellent. And Susan Jewell will be talking about space medicine. And Lee Irons will be talking about a sustainable human mission and engineering. So I will see you all tomorrow. Thank you again, Professor. And I hope maybe some of the students will someday join your program. And uh, let, me, let me tell you about Perseverance before I leave you. Okay. Uh, and it's the first time uh, we have used autonomous navigation to land. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a new technology, uh, but it performed uh, exactly as you wanted it to. Uh, in uh, the software uh, is a, a program called Terrain Rel Relative Navigation. Train is the nickname for it. What it does is that, of course, all this is happening autonomously because we cannot control things so far away. So what it does is that as your spacecraft is flying down to a landing site, it takes a picture. It takes a picture with its eyes and then it compares it with a picture in a map that is stored, coordinates it, and then flies to the target that is on the map. And uh, it tells you how autonomy is working uh, in, uh, in machines. Now, there must be some people in your group who's talking about artificial intelligence. This is one branch of artificial intelligence that is saying that uh, I see you and I'm going to do something for you. And uh, so robots are advancing very fast and I hope you enjoy um, the next talk and talk, uh, ask about um, um, a terrain re relative navigation. Thank you all and uh, enjoy the rest of your um, program, summer program. Uh, uh, you're all lucky uh, to be in, uh, uh, in the Mars Society's high school program. And Nicole, thank you for pestering me and <laughs> reminding me uh, to come talk to you all. Good luck and en enjoy summer. Thank you for being here. And I hope to see you in October. Okay. Do. Thank you. Bye okay, students. Bye -bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.